and welcome to Allen High School's discussion of solutions at the pre-AP or 10th grade honors chemistry level. We are talking about varieties of solutions and we're moving into solutions with ionic solutes and covalent solvents. And primarily as the solvent, we are going to be focusing on water as our prime solvent. Now, ionic uh, compounds will only dissolve in polar solvents, not nonpolar. So we have to have a polar solvent. We could look at ionics in acetic acid, ionics in ammonia. There's a variety of solutions we could look at, but we're going to focus on water. Now you've seen these before, these solubility rules. If a compound is soluble, we will use AQ as its state. If it is insoluble, and a solid that is an insoluble in water will form a precipitate, and we give that the solid or S state designation. And so we will be talking quite a bit about precipitates and, sol and uh, ionic solvents, or excuse me, solutes. All right, so let's move on. And I'm assuming you know how to read your solubility charts. You will be given those on your test. So let's talk a little bit more about the specifics and making sure that you can read that chart. I think it would be a good idea if you paused the video right now and tried to do this example 12.5 on your own so that you can check it. Now, since we're talking about water, Water dissolves so many things, and water is so important in life that we tend to call it the universal, meaning it dissolves almost everything. It's a universal solvent. All right. Now, for each of these, we want to use the solubility rules to dis determine that if it is soluble or not. The first rule says all group ones are soluble without exception. If you will memorize that, you will save yourself a bit of time in looking at that. The second one is silver bromide. So if you look at the rule that talks about uh, chloride, bromide, and iodide, it says all are soluble except silver lead to mercury one. So this would form a precipitate or a solid. Ammonium, all are soluble without ex exception, and all nitrates are soluble without exception. So that's going to be an aqueous. Now, if you look at the fluoride rule, you'll see that many of the fluorides are soluble with a few exceptions, and calcium is one of the exceptions that is not soluble, or it would form a solid precipitate. Oxides are a little bit more complicated. We're going to call those solid precipitates for now. They actually chemically react with water, so um, we'll call them insoluble. And when you get into AP, we'll talk about it in more de uh, details. Hydroxides, the rule for hydroxides is that all of them are insoluble except for your strong bases. Your strong bases are group 1 and group 2 hydroxides except beryllium and magnesium. Beryllium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxides are not considered strong bases. So this is a considered a strong base, so it is soluble. Carbonates, they are all insoluble except for group one and ammonium. So this is insoluble, it would form a precipitate. Calcium sulfate, if you look at the sulfate rules, you'll see that most are soluble with the exception of silver, lead 2, mercury 1, and calcium strontium barium. So that would form a precipitate. So that's how you read. Now, when ionics are soluble, they dissociate. And we want to use that word to dissociate means to split apart into their ions. We are not decomposing these. We are simply splitting into ions, separate ions. Um, we're going to write a lot of different reactions for these. Uh, when we talk about polar covalent compounds, they dissolve 
but they will not dissociate. Dissociate means to split into ions. If there are no ions present, it can't dissociate. That doesn't mean they don't dissolve, just that dissociation is not a part of that dissolving process. So let's take a look at some more detail on this. Let's be, uh, we, again, we have to be able to illustrate these and look at pictures of these. So to illustrate the ions, notice that the sodium and the chloride separated. Those ions are no longer ionically bonded to one another. And we see that each ion is separated by many, many waters, right? And since chloride is negative, the partially positive or hydrogen end is oriented towards the chloride. Since sodium ion is positively charged, the partially negative or oxygen end is attracted to the sodium ion. So let's look at potassium bromide. So when if I took solid potassium bromide and I put it into water, I get aqueous potassium ion. Let me erase that. Sorry about that. Aqueous potassium ion. Okay, plus and we put an AQ and I'd get a bromide ion. That's how we would write this as a reaction. If we want to draw the picture, we want to show the potassium ion fully dissociated or separated from the bromide ion, and then we want to draw water molecules around them. And for the potassium, since it's positive, we would put the oxygen end of water oriented towards these. Since it's the oxygen end that is partially negative, and how many depends on the size of the ion. We showed you to, sh we asked you to show at least three, and to show that partially negative, let me put that partially negative. Now to show this attraction, again, we remember we use dotted lines if we're going to try to show that attraction. And this would be called an ion dipole attraction. The dipole is the permanent separation of charge that gives us the polar nature of water. For the bromide, it would be the hydrogen end that would be attracted to the bromide. So I want to show at least three waters attracted around that bromide ion. And it would look something like this, with the partial positive of water being attracted to that negative charge on the bromide. And again, we would call that an ion dipole attraction. So you need to be able to draw those. So we'll get you some practice of, on that in class. And maybe we can be drawing on some tables. I know I like to do that. It gives us a little break. So in summary, when we talk about these types of pictures, remember the key term is like dissolves like. So with covalent and covalent, we want to go by that rule like dissolves like. So that means it's going to be polar dissolving in polar or, whoops, that's an A, crummy A, but that's an A, or nonpolar like gasoline dissolving in nonpolar solvents. Nonpolar solutes in nonpolar solvents. For covalent and ionic, if it's a nonpolar, it is insoluble. Ionics are insoluble. For polar and ionic, the solubility is going to depend on the solubility rules. All right. Now, the key here is, is we're going to have to, the, what we consider as we predict 
is we have to look at the balance of forces that are broken and formed. So we're going to have to, for it to be soluble, we have to break an ion ion has to be broken and it takes energy to break a force of attraction. We have to break the hydrogen or some, not all of them, but some of the hydrogen bonds in water are broken. It we have to break them and again it takes to break. And then we have to form an ion dipole. The ion attracted to water. We form that and we free energy when we form. Whoops, freeze to form. Freeze to form attractions. So energy is released when we formed. And we have to look at the energy that we have to invest in the process versus the return on our, our investment. And that's what's going to dictate what whether or not something is going to form a solution. And that's where we get our solubility rules. All right, so that gives us a start on these, and we're going to continue our discussion on dissolving and dissociating. And until then, this is, as always, signing off.